All right. So I want this to be a chance to get to know you guys as more as people, um, not just like C-suite people sitting in their offices. Um, I want to, so I've got a, a list of like questions about um, the business you're building. Also a little bit about you guys, um, about like lifestyle and strategy and stuff like that as well. So it'll be a bit of a mixed bag. Um, and I've also tried to minimize the questions that I could have answered by reading your website or watching your quarterly webcasts. So Hopefully this is um some you know a lot of these hopefully you haven't had to chat about it before, which will be new information. Yeah, that was good. All right. Sweet, let's do it. Firstly, I, I noticed you guys were at the Red Eye Serial Acquirers event. Um, what did you guys get out of that? Um uh, if I take that one as I I, I was attending there. Yeah, so. Exactly. Um no, I think it's always good to good to see yourself in the kind of a scene also where you where, where you want to be profiled profile as well so yeah that you can take the opportunity to um i mean maybe not that much on listening to the presentations directly the, the basic basic uh, corporate presentations but rather i would say rather the uh the, the questions and discussion with, with with which was there around so i think you can actually from a company building point of view you, you can take a lot of of the way people talk about how they, for example, do acquisitions, how they approach them, um, how they talk about culture, um, and 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 also reflecting on what they don't talk about. So uh, all the things that they want to bring up as as a company on on the let's say more on the equity story side. So what is the focus? So I think you get out get out of that quite 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 a lot, and you can reflect to more on what. We as a company and overall are as well so extremely helpful and and, and uh, really appreciated work that the guys at red eye red eye doing yeah it's a cool event um so regarding other serial acquirers um if you you, you bring up in a lot of your meetings the barrio way and that's sort of the words you use like this is that we want to do things the barrio way so what areas did you see, do you see yourself as um I guess, uh, different to the other serial acquirers or maybe even just explain what is the Barrio way? Yeah, well, I think I think the differentiation is always a bit, uh, um, I mean, that's not that relevant how you differentiate yourself as long as you know what the playbook itself is, what, what, you're, what you're doing. So I, 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 I perceive that, that uh, more the, the Barrio way is actually built on the basic um, kind of three pillars on, uh, which could be labeled as kind of sustainable long-term operations in my view. So um, A, being decentralized as many many um, serial acquirers are, um, first of all. Then heavy focus on on uh, uh, capital allocation. And, and thirdly, on also on kind of uh, making sure that everything is done on a long-term uh, long perspective. Um, and... Uh, and of course, there's a lot of details in in, in behind. I mean, below those uh, three core areas on uh, how you work and how the processes are built, how the how the how the company ticks ticks in one way. But um, um, I think uh, uh, we are still, you know, we're still early in the days of the uh, of the journey as such, and and to be able to kind of iron out clearly that okay, this is the way the Borea way is. I mean. Uh, that will take some time. So if you if you uh, if you would go and ask from uh, twenty key employees of the firm, what is the Borea way? You will for sure have still I think uh, twenty different answers. But I hope down the line, a couple of years, a um, couple of years later on, there will be more resemblance in those answers you will you will get. So I think that will that will evolve over time. And uh, and the key is that you just continue to continuously learn on the mistakes you do. And, and and you continue to try to evolve uh, the way you operate and narrow down kind of the the basic core core concepts in the in the organization. Yeah, cool. I might uh, for Aku to talk a, bit, a little bit about some of the finances stuff um, regarding debt and access to debt. Corporate bond markets is probably going to become maybe diff more difficult, maybe a little bit more expensive. Um, most likely, I would say. Uh, how do you guys think about debt and your bonds? It's like a 
um, two sides. It's, it's like a double-edged sword kind of thing. Um, debt brings growth and it fuel to go out and make acquisitions. But uh, how do you think about the corporate bond market, the debt market for you guys? Mm. Yeah, ex exactly as you said. Double, it's it's sore. Um, I think in in our case, what we have communicated also already some some two two and a half three years is that that we want to we want to of course utilize the balance sheet, but at the same time we want to keep the leverage stable uh, on base basically on the level that it has so far been and definitely definitely uh, the situation has changed uh, luckily we were we were able to refinance our facilities in the very beginning of of 22 for example just just before the ukrainian crisis started so in that sense we were we were lucky lucky and, and uh, can still utilize the funds that that we have there and and don't have Kind of immediate rush for the for the market. Same same goes with the hybrid bond that we we issued in in early early twenty twenty two. Uh, but I, I guess that uh, after some some time, maybe maybe somewhere next year, mid next year, we we definitely uh, need to think about refinancing again and and uh, how how the situation looks then. Uh, in that market environment will be seen but uh, but at, at the moment we we still have some facilities left uh, un, untouched so in, in that sense we are we are in a good position now do you get nervous about the refinancing part that probably is going to happen next year does that is there any um does that make you nervous at all no, oh, actually, actually not. Of course, the interest rates have been increasing a, a lot, but uh, but at the same time, as 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 we watch very closely on a monthly and quarterly basis and the outlook all the time that how the leverage is is uh, is developing, I'm I'm not at least uh, sleeping sleeping badly because of that, at least yet. <laughs> yeah, maybe to reflect. I mean. I would say to note on that that if you look at the uh, um, the quality of the cash flows that we that we have in the business today, I mean uh, they have I mean improved improved a lot compared to let's say three years where we were um, due to the actions that we've taken both in the existing companies that we owned already three years back, but then also also importantly through the acquisitions that we've done. So more uh, the diversification work that we've been doing, entering into you know, new geographies, entering into Sweden, um, uh, also some, some other countries, also entering into new industrial areas where the uh, exposure from an uh, end customer and end sector point of view is a bit different. So I think um, I think the, the, the company sits in a, on a much stronger ground from uh, kind of a diversification, resiliency point of view, if you look at it that way, compared to where we started. Uh, started in three years back which is of course a key point in that regard as well yeah okay that makes sense the quality of the cash flows if they're diversified um you hopefully be able to not get um you hopefully be able to refinance at good rates i guess if people will see the confidence that those quality cash flows are so okay that makes sense i think that's the right way to, go, way to think about it too uh next question i had was um about the dividend policy so Recently, you changed it to say uh, to target a growing dividend, taking into consideration capital allocation priorities. My question is, why have the dividend at all? Don't you guys need the money to grow the business and shareholders are just getting taxed on that dividend? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, no, it's, a, it's an interesting question, right? Um, I mean, uh, we can continue to invest money on those on those rates of ret I mean returns that we've been able to do so far, of course, majority of the cash flows uh, should go, and we and we'll also go to 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 both acquiring new companies, but also then uh, reinvesting back to back to the operations. But I I think it's a um I mean we are, really we look at our current shareholder base. Um, uh, uh, of course, the, the the that also uh, the 
current policy reflects that shareholder base, what is what is there today. And uh, and kind of we've been thinking in it so wise that we started from somewhere, we took a step, uh, step ahead, let's say, introducing a bit of flexibility into into um, uh, into the policy itself. Um, and, uh, and 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 then seeing um, you know kind of at the same time respecting the the shareholders to to whom the the dividends are right or wrong they are important uh, but uh, well, nevertheless uh, taking a, a one step forward what then the policy in the future will be uh, let's see but uh, but I would still say that uh, definitely we we don't we will not see the dividend absolute amount of dividends paid to be increasing at the at the similar rate that we hope that the the actual earnings will uh will increase so the the difference you know in, in a way will will for sure uh, between those two metrics uh increase over over time yeah exactly and maybe maybe to add still that that we we increased kind of a flexibility already last year in 22 spring when we decided or the and our general meeting uh, decided to, to kind of divide the dividend payment into two parts, which is also more and more seen in in, in other companies, also in in, in Helsinki uh, stock stock exchange. So I think that that also brings flexibility that that, that the board of directors can can decide on on the next payment. Then, for example, in in autumn, if if, if seen relevant. So it probably leads me to my next question nicely. Um, the role of, is it Preto, Pratio Capital? Um, yeah, yeah, Preto, Preto Capital, yeah. Yep. Uh, do you think they will stay the majority shareholder? And is that an influential decision maker for that dividend policy? Uh, well, I, I think, I mean, Preto is a, um, I mean, of course, Simon, Simon, who is our chairman and a majority shareholder, is the, he's the better guy to answer this question. But, uh, but from from uh, from what we understand of that, and what I understand from Simon's views is that he wants a, he wants to be a, a significant shareholder for for a long period of time in the company. He's investing uh, without um, investing his money without time horizon in that sense. And uh, whether uh, he sees him, himself as a majority shareholder a major shareholder uh that might be a different different question but uh, nevertheless we have an owner on the back who's who's in it for the long term and uh, um who has done it uh, done it well in his life uh in terms of building companies and, and with that expertise that is there on the back is is uh definitely helpful um and uh, given that we have a 70 percent shareholder surely he has uh, influence on the on the dividend policy as well. Yeah, yeah, I assume so. That's cool. Uh, next one. You mentioned in the Q4 webcast that some costs are coming towards ESG related stuff. Is that a compliance thing? Because maybe this is just me talking, but my criticism would be that this is kind of a waste of time and money if your businesses are already doing their best in those areas naturally. Do you really need to spend money on ESG stuff? Uh, well, uh, it's a good a good point. I mean, I, I think that uh, I would rather talk about sustainability overall rather than ESG. I mean, if you label ESG separate to your, let's say, overall business and strategic thinking, I mean, then then, it, then you already went south with the thinking. I, I think that, um, um, I mean, A, you, you, you will have, I mean, there will be an additional regulation in terms of reporting what you need to report as a stock listed a stock listed entity in, uh, in in Europe in the coming coming years uh, but I, I think it's more of uh, uh, it's, it's more it's more of a topic where we believe as that as an, as an owner of uh, small entrepreneurial businesses you can also um, this is one of the areas where you can where you can provide uh, provide support where you can bring some value to the businesses by taking and supporting the, the companies with the view on, on how to build long-term sustainable business. And um, I mean, this was one of the topics that we were uh, we were workshopping on uh, during our leadership academy offsite last week in, in, in Czech Republic. And uh, and I think this is, uh, it is an interesting area where our entrepreneurs and company leaders see uh, a possibility to, to, to let's say, improve their uh, 
respective positions in the markets where they operate in. And with the backing that you have from a strong, stable shareholder also to maybe not something that's, that's a private company, they would be able to utilize that that well. Uh, so there is clearly a, a room to room to play. But I, I mean, I, I, I think it's um, sustainability overall is, is something that is of key regardless of regulation if you want to yeah. uh, make long term profits and, and as such what we try to push internally also in the communication is that don't see it as necessity or regu uh, regulation rather see it as an opportunity uh, that can uh, make your business thrive in the long run um, otherwise uh, the thinking i mean we will not succeed in doing that and maybe reflection um, for the future uh, also from the financing field as we discussed about the Coming, coming refinancing uh, around somewhere, uh, of course, sustainability and sustainable financing will will definitely increase increase the fo focus uh, going forward. And already now, what is is seen that, that the larger and larger share of the of the new issuances are tied to some green uh, covenants or or green green targets. So so we have to. We have to be awake also in, in that field. Cool. Next question about share issuance, like in your share issuance policy. Do you guys utilize, do you guys have a stock-based compensation plan in place for you guys in particular and uh, leaders of your the subsidiaries? Yeah, we do. I mean, um, I mean, if you look at the shareholder base today, I mean, Prato owns roughly... Uh, I mean, slightly more than 70%. And then the larger group of uh, key individuals, so the group management team, the group team, but also then the entrepreneurs and, um, and, and, comp and, 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 and people in the leading positions, we own together, I would say somewhere around 9% uh, of, of the stock today. Um, the way we have arrived into that is, uh, has been a, uh, has been a consequence of a couple of different actions. So first, when, when uh, I mean myself or Aku, uh, some of the uh, and some of the other key members of the team on the group 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 level, we acquired and uh, bought shares directly from Preato when we when we uh, uh, when we joined. Uh, so th this was just I mean buying roughly at market I mean uh, at market prices during. The, let's say early days of the story, so roughly three years ago. Um, that way, we built, let's say, the, the the most significant part of the ownership that we have. Uh, then, during the last, now we've done, I mean, under our era, uh, seventeen transactions, acquisitions, and uh, in connection with those deals, we wanted to uh, use, uh, I mean, pay, uh, let's say, a ten to twenty percent share of the purchase prices as um, a mother company shares in order to uh, to provide for that incentive and that earnings opportunity for the entrepreneurs through the uh, mother company share as well so that has been a a, a a a a pattern that we have utilized i would say maybe in 60 70 percent of the deals we've done um so many of the guys many of the entrepreneurs who have joined own uh, shares through that way and uh, then third, as a third item, um, we organized as part of the, let's say, uh, objective to align further and further align the interests of uh, the shareholders and personnel. We organized a one and a half million euro uh, share issue for the personnel in, in June 22, I think it was. Uh, so then um, one and a half million euro was invested by the people uh, I think roughly 40 individuals into the company and in connection with that uh, program there was roughly the, the key individuals roughly 25 to 30 of those uh, were entitled to a so-called matching matching share plan which means that if the, if the person is in the company three years from that period of time he will uh, be entitled to receive one share per each three shares he or she bought in connection with that uh, share issue. So that is basically the way we've arrived into that and, and wanted to 
uh, gradually increase the opportunities of people owning the share ultimately and, and, and providing for that opportunity that we that we see in the firm. Great. Next one. So uh, you've said many times that you want to be a good owner for the businesses that you acquire. It seems a bit cryptic. So what can what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean in simplicity? Um, um, a, a you need to be you need I mean you need to be able to demonstrate yourself, demonstrate yourself as a as a long term owner. Ultimately, you will see that through in the results that the company is doing, right? So they need to be continuing uh, on a on a good path uh, for longer period of time. You will need to have uh, you, although we are let's say light touch decentralized, not hassling with operations uh, and operational companies in that way, but but there's still certain things that you need to be able to, to, to provide for them. Uh, for instance, when it comes to governance, when it comes to sharing best practices, learning, training, stuff like that, there needs to be a positive, positive contribution. And, um, and I think what in, in, in our mind, what the most important items are that, I mean, simply by being a long-term owner, um, uh, keeping the culture, keeping the brands and so forth, um, you know, the fact that the business can continue to operate um, uh, over a longer period of time like that, it already starts from there. And then, you know, our ability to bring succession through people, uh, new, new people joining who can guide the firms for a longer period of time. I think that's, uh, that's one of the key, uh, key areas overall in, in this game for longer run. So that, uh, so that they, so that it's not only the entrepreneur who, successfully um, operate the company for 20 or 30 years, but then you can build on that succession and build on that long-term continuity uh, longer period of time. I think if I would need to say something on what that in reality, I mean, what is the, the key, key, key factor that would be in my, my view, the case. I think sorry, I muted myself. Sorry about that. Let me try again. Um, okay. So that was, okay. That's good. I, I think that's great. Um, so let me ask you this question, and it's uh, I, I didn't mean to, I, it's not meant to be a setup, but I'm interested to hear what you say to this question now. After saying all that stuff that you just mentioned, um, which I fully agree, I think that's exactly, if I was doing it in your shoes, I'd be wanting to do the same thing, thinking about everything long, really long term. So if someone came and offered you 2 billion euro for the business, for Barrio, of, I know you've got a major shareholder who probably would want to take it, but let's assume it was your decision. Uh, would you guys take it? You want to go first? Uh, ah, tricky one. Um, Two billion euro against market cap of one hundred million at the at the moment. How so? Um, <clears throat> I think although, as, as Gary mentioned, we have long-term prospects and, and plans and, and, and so forth, but I think still 20 times current market cap would be so so big come out that most likely most likely I would I would take that <laughs> and reinvest reinvest to something new new and interesting interesting again. Gary? I would say the same. I mean, I would take I would take the money I would take the money and bring the same gang. Uh, together again and uh, build a new build a new platform i, I think that uh, i mean we would be stupid if we would not take that money given where the, what the value of the business is today and, yes, exactly. and then it would uh, secondly i think it would uh, provide a great opportunity to 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 build from scratch in that way uh, something that there's always i mean i'm not saying we don't have a good platform that on on top of which to build on but there's always some some legacy to that where you have started from, and uh, if we could uh, do it all over again, I think uh, starting from a clean sheet uh, would uh, would be of course a, a nice thing to do. So I think that's the way, that's what I would do. Cool. Uh, would you ever sell any of the because some of the businesses are uh, legacy businesses that maybe don't quite fit the direction you want to take it? Would you ever would you consider selling them off? Um, I think we are, I mean, what we have divested, I mean, first of all, we divested the Russian operations because of, 
because of let's say obvious of obvious reasons that was that was let's say not a tough decision to take as such given where the world 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 was starting to go. Yeah. Um. Um. I think I mean a we start from we start from that that we should not be selling. I mean that's that's the way you when you acquire a company and when we acquire a company we start from the from the point of view that you don't you don't end up selling any and in any point of time. Uh, I mean having having said that I I think that um, I hope that we will not be in those situations. But it, I mean uh, you know it it could of course go also that way that you are simply not able to run a business uh, in a way that you uh, in a way that uh, kind of fits to the overall long-term objectives of the group um, I don't see that the current current portfolio wouldn't have those characteristics uh, because I think even though some of the let's say lower margin businesses which were there um, three years ago um, there's been a, a significant uptick in the in many of the margins of those companies, which is a good thing. Yep. However, however many, I mean, some of those still are by nature companies which will have a difficulty or it can be even a mission impossible to bring those to the levels that we target when we look at new companies. But they still have a good role in the, in the business supporting the cash flow and supporting the earnings, let's say steady uh, earnings growth. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, I would say to the question, I would ne never say never in that sense, but uh, that is definitely not not where not from where we uh, what what we would like to do as such. Yeah, they seem to be performing okay. The legacy one so far, I just think you should be yeah relatively proud of them. I think they're okay too. All right. Um, oh, I'm running out of time. It says here on my screen. Okay, I got ten minutes. It's good. Uh, which serial acquirers, probably the Sweden ones, I assume, do you admire the most, and why? She doesn't have to be the Sweden ones, by the way. It can be any of them. Well, I've, I've said yeah, it. I've yeah. said it many times that I like Lifco. Uh, Lifco, I think uh, you know the track record itself is just crazy. I mean, if you look at the way way they've been able to, and it's always a question looking at it from outside. It's difficult to grasp on why they have been able to do it better than anyone else in the Swedish arena, from from my point of view. But uh, the portfolio. Uh, of businesses, the returns they're able to generate on and the operating margins that they have from financial profile point of view, I think it's number one. Um, also, I, I have been followed the company for quite a quite a long time. I think the management and management and the way they communicate about the business, where the priorities are, um, really, I mean, resonates with me quite uh, uh, quite nicely. I would say that the other company which I like to follow uh, from a US point of view is uh, is Transdime, which is a I mean a bit of a different uh, different setup of course, but uh, and a totally different playbook compared to the typical Swedish ones, for example. But I I, th I think still that model of being able to bring companies uh, and having really sort of a strong of an operating model and and, and being able to do good for the businesses that join join that uh, uh, company is quite uh, tremendous. But I would say it's uh, again going back to that that you can do it in many many different ways as long as you know what you're doing um, and, and 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 having the clarity around okay this is the way you do it. I think that's number one. Yeah, actually, I, I don't have so much so much to be honest to to add on on that one. I uh, we've been now. Was benchmarking and looking to looking the peers here, uh, but uh, these are the old, old, older older ones that Gary Gary mentioned. Maybe maybe just to mention a, a bit newer one is the Momentum Group, which I have personally a bit bit benchmarked also that how they as a relatively newer listed entity how they have been communicated or. To the to the market, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much much it. Yeah, there's some pretty good ones there. Very good. Um, the there's a company over there called St Stores Kogan. I don't know if you're familiar. You probably yeah. are. They yeah. kind of went. They've been really suffering, right? And the path that they went down, I guess, was more of like their acquisitions that they were making haven't really come to fruition very well. They've been finding it difficult to um, uh, keep margins like 
uh, from where they what they're paying to what they then take over the business for being finding it difficult to keep margins. There's only really a subtle difference between them and say Lifco. How do you go down? How do you make sure you don't go down that path <laughs> rather than the, trying to emulate Lifco, which would be uh, the optimal path, I would assume. Well, I, I think that, I mean, that comes down to the playbook itself. Uh, I mean, in our case, it is actually a book. So we've started to write that manual or the, the Boreo playbook in that sense, which was act the, the, the other topics that we were discussing with our uh, key leaders in, 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 in Czech Republic last week. But uh, I think there's a really, and that's a really good question. There's a bit, really fine line of, uh, I mean, at the same time, being able to acquire at, let's say, uh, kind of growing rates, and then at the same time, being able to be a good owner for, for the businesses. And I think we are balancing with that uh, also currently internally at the moment. And I, I think that the acquisition pace as such, we've, uh, it's been quite active uh, at, our, at our end. Um, we feel that, let's say, if you look at now, uh, for instance, bringing the five companies into the structure per annum feels also quite uh, uh, good from a managerial point of view. So whether our business area organization is able to, to, to onboard these companies in support them in, let's say, uh, putting the companies together with the entrepreneurs on the right track for the, during the first six months after an acquisition. And, and things like that. So I think there is a there is a certain line to that also when it comes to the kind of rate of acquisitions, how many deals you do, uh, and how much you can actually uh, work with the companies uh, companies together. So I think that's really important. And uh, then, but I, I think in addition to that, uh, it is important to make to 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 maintain the discipline that you have on the acquisition market. So you need to be, you need to be sure that the, uh, let's say, the reinvestment machine works in that way that you have enough opportunities uh, to which you can invest in, and then you then you maintain that discipline and and, and uh, don't start paying for acquisition because of uh, making acquisition just because of being able to do that, but uh, rather do less acquisition which are good ones and meet the return objectives that you have. Yeah, your returns. Uh, sorry, your buying prices by the looks of it, four point six after four point six times EV to EBIT after yep. earnouts, something like that. I think that's right, but that's a very good buying price. So, you've whatever you're doing, keep finding them at that price because that's working well. Uh, two questions to go. Um, one first one is when you talk to your investors um, or people interested in the company this is an opportunity to like, what would be the biggest misconceptions that they have about Barrio? A good question. Good question. I think um, maybe I would answer that this way that, um, I mean, when it comes to the international investors who have been investing into uh, similar companies, I mean, similar business models before, I don't think that there actually is too much of this misconceptions. I mean, there's they, they ask the right questions and it's fine tuning along to understand the approach better and so forth. But uh, but I think then when it comes to the, our home domestic Finnish market, um, it, it is so that we are, I mean, I would, I would label ourselves as, as the kind of only pure play uh, serial acquirer in the in, in, in this country. And, uh, and, and, and because of that, uh, investors are not really that familiar with the business model. So it is we we are we continue to be on that on that path of let's say educating also the um, I mean both institutional investors but also retail investors in in Finland in understanding what we are. And I, I think there is that there there are still big misconceptions around when it when it comes to the Finnish territory. Uh, I think that's quite interesting given that uh, uh, Helsinki and Stockholm are one hour flight away. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I think, I think this decentralization structure overall, that what it actually means when we talk about decentralization, because that can also, also mean different things, different companies. If, if you have a lot, a lot of different units in different countries, it, it's also decentralized 
model, but our model is totally different. And, and then it also quite often comes to the synergies and, and uh, maybe that, that is not, yeah. not, not a very key item in our uh, operating model. Yeah, very good. Last one for you guys. Uh, I've got a minute to go. So I uh, appreciate your time and yeah, this will, this will go really well on the channel. I'm sure I've had a lot of people wanting this me to interview you guys. Uh, last question is what type of car do you guys each drive? That's, uh, well, we, we both have Volvos. <laughs> uh, we both have Volvos. Um, I have a, I have a XC90 uh, because of the reason that the, uh, a, I have uh, three small small children. You need space, and the thing, secondly, uh, is a lot of sport attached to the uh, life. So you need to have a ski box on top of that to be able to fit your cross country skis, and take your mountain bikes and so forth. So uh, um, that's that's my my part. Yeah, and as Corey said, I also have Volvo, and uh, but it's smaller, XC60. So. Uh, I have a bit old, older sons, uh, 16 and 18 on, almost already, so we don't have uh, children and chair and, and so forth anymore, but I need to fit my, my golf back there. <laughs> and also, good Very car good. For, for our uh, environment. Very good, guys. Thanks for your time. Uh, the recording is just about to end, but a big, uh, lots of appreciation from my side, so thanks for your time. No, thank, you so right. much. thank you so much, Andrew. I appreciate it. Take care, bye guys. Bye.